Well, the COVID epidemic has brought the worlds of infection control, public health and medicine into our daily lives. We have learned, we have listened, we have searched the web, um, we have sought out all kinds of opinions and it can be very daunting and confusing. The purpose of today is to talk directly to our local medical experts. They will be telling us not only about the pandemic as it exists today, but what we as a community of Lincoln can expect going forward. We know that no one has a crystal ball, but Lincoln is so fortunate to have world-class medical expertise to rely on. And so I hope you'll take time to listen to this important information. I wanna start out with a conversation with Dr. James Nora, who is board certified in infectious disease. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Nora. Thank you for having me. You know, one of the biggest questions, um, one of the areas of concern is around uh, the mode of transmission for COVID. So could you just talk briefly about the transmission of this virus? That's a great question. And it really plays into how to prevent transmission, uh, prevent uh, cases. Knowing how the virus is spread is the best way uh, for people to take precautions to help prevent getting sick. So there are really, um, there are really two uh, important means of transmission. And uh, one, the most important by far is direct person-to-person -person transmission. So this is respiratory droplets. Um, this is similar to influenza. Um, the second uh, mode of transmission is environmental contamination. And this is probably a lot less important than person-to-person -person transmission, but it's not completely unimportant either. So it's important to keep that in mind. I'll talk just briefly about droplet transmission, infectious respiratory particles that are ejected when someone sneezes, when they cough, even when they're just talking in a casual conversation or singing. Any of these uh, can be means for ejecting these infectious droplet uh, particles. Typically, these concentrate about three to six feet from the person who's doing the talking or the coughing. The droplets will hang in the air for a limited time. And there are different factors that go into how long those, uh, part of those droplets will hang in the air. But for the most part, it's a matter of minutes to maybe an hour. It's not hours to days. It's mostly uh, a few minutes or a little longer. And so to reduce risk from droplet transmission, wearing a mask, uh, at all times is a great way to prevent a person who is infectious without knowing it from spreading it to others. And it's also a, a means of a person protecting themselves from droplets that may be floating around in the air. Social distancing, this is important as well. If you try and maintain that six foot distance, greatly reduces the risk of transmission. And then finally, hand hygiene. So hand hygiene may not seem as obvious a, a means of reducing transmission from a person to person standpoint, but whenever we're wearing masks, it's very common to try that people will touch and feel the mask and adjust it. And it's really best not to do that. Uh, it's ideal to put the mask on at the very get go and then not mess with it until uh, you take it off. But if you do come in contact with the mask, it's important to do hand hygiene as soon as possible uh, afterwards. And then, Moving on to talk a little bit about environmental contamination. So this is transmission from surfaces. So somebody coughs or sneezes and maybe they cough all over a countertop and then another person comes along and they wipe their hands on the countertop and then they rub their eyes. And so, so that can be a way that uh, transmission occurs, but it's not nearly as important as person to person transmission. The way we reduce the risk uh, of this is just frequent hand hygiene and then cleaning high-risk surfaces. So it's not necessary to clean every surface in homes or offices every day, but trying to clean high-risk surfaces like doorknobs, computer keyboards, phones, those uh, may be a way of reducing risk. I know there's a lot of questions about medications, um, especially medications that you can take to prevent um, you from acquiring COVID-19. Can you tell us not only about the medications like this, preventive medicines, but also um, the medications used to treat people who do have COVID-19? So that's a great question too. And it's really important to say at the get-go that right now there are no FDA approved medications either to treat 
or to prevent COVID-19. So we have investigational agents and the FDA has released those under a special emergency use authorization. And then there are uh, other medications that are on the market for other reasons that can be used in an off-label fashion. But right now there are no actual medications that we can use to treat or prevent this that have an FDA approval. The ones that people have heard about most are probably hydroxychloroquine. And this is uh, can be used in an off-label use or uh, an investigational. There is an EUA for that as well. Um, this medication is used in a hospital setting to treat. It has been conjectured that maybe people could take this medication as a preventive agent. Right now, I would not recommend that. And the CDC, the IDSA all recommend against taking medications like hydroxychloroquine uh, in an outpatient setting just as a preventive measure. It may be that down the road, we will have a recommendation for that. If somebody is interested in, in taking medications in a preventive strategy, the recommendation is that it be done in the context of a clinical trial. And there are some that are in place, but I don't believe there are any in Nebraska uh, right now as a preventive strategy. So I think the University of Minnesota has a trial. Um, that's not that far away. That's some, if people are really interested, they could investigate that. But right now, the best way to prevent the virus is to not get exposed. And that's social distancing, wearing a mask, and um, you know, good hand hygiene. As far as treatment in the hospital, um, the, investiga the investigational agents that we use most often are convalescent plasma and remdesivir. And um, we've seen some mo what, what appears to be some modest success from that, but we don't have the final word back on whether these are truly uh, beneficial and it, ultimately, if they are beneficial, I would expect there will be an FDA approval. Well, talking about people in the hospital, I think it's fair to say that many or the majority of people who are diagnosed with COVID do not need hospitalization, um, not at that level. And so can you give us an idea of the percentage of people who are diagnosed versus the percentage who are hospitalized? Absolutely. That's one of a, that's a really important question from both uh, uh, a public health standpoint and from an uh, individual patient care standpoint. Um, we don't know how many people uh, are truly asymptomatic with this illness. Um, by asymptomatic, what I mean is a person gets exposed to the virus, SARS-CoV-2, and um, many people will go on to develop some symptoms, but a significant percentage will never have symptoms at all. So those are called asymptomatic uh, patients. And it could be that that uh, is about 25%. That's a common estimate that I've seen, but it could be higher. Um, so a lot of people who get exposed will never get symptoms at all. Of those that get exposed and who develop symptoms, the vast majority will have only mild symptoms. And it's probably on the order of 80% or more that have only mild symptoms. Um, and these individuals will have symptoms no different than the common cold. And the best thing to do is just stay home stay in isolation until the symptoms have resolved and your healthcare provider can give particular guidance on when it's safe to get out of isolation. Um, for those that may have more serious illness, maybe 10 to 20%, um, the, a, a subset of those uh, will go on to be hospitalized and, um, and a, a, ver a subset of those will have severe illness where they may end up in the ICU, but that is not the, not, not the experience for the majority of patients. That's great to know. Um, the last question that I have for you right now is um, vaccines. We've heard a lot about vaccines. People are anxious to hear about that. Um, it's a very complicated area, but could you give us like a lay person's version of the current status of vaccines? Absolutely. So vaccines, uh, we all hope will be an important part of preventing COVID-19 in the future. We are not there yet. And uh, you, you can uh, look on the, on the internet and you'll see all kinds of different estimates. People are throwing out conjectures. And the truth is nobody really knows when we'll have vaccines. My guess, uh, and, and this is just simply from uh, hearing what other, uh, what, what experts say, uh, this would be one to two years before we have a, a vaccine. And that's probably a, a best case scenario. The way the vaccine will likely work uh, is uh, multiple is by multiple means, and we really have um, 
different targets for this particular uh, virus. There's the surface proteins, there are proteins within the virus. And it's very possible that a vaccine may come out that's that targets multiple parts of the virus. So it could really be two vaccines. Maybe it's combined into one. Maybe you have to get two different injections. Um, will it be something that you have to get every year like a flu shot? Uh, possibly. If it is that way, it's going to be a little different than the flu shot. The flu shot benefits us by one, boosting our immunity to influenza, but it also benefits us because the influenza virus is very, very good at changing and mutating every year. The virus that causes COVID-19 is not likely to mutate as much as influenza. So it's not that we would be getting a yearly vaccine um, just to adjust to all the mutations. However, we could be getting a yearly vaccine just to boost immunity because it's not clear how, good, how long the immunity to a vaccine will, uh, will last. So uh, constantly changing. I, I do have one final follow-up question, and that is simply, you know, we're hearing about how there's more and more testing becoming available. Do you recommend people get tested right now, even if they're not symptomatic? So right now, I would not recommend getting tested if you are completely asymptomatic. It's really up to the individual to decide. There is ample testing available for those that want it. And there is, the, there is a initiative, the Test Nebraska initiative, that really allows patients to decide if they want to get tested or not. And if they do, they can go through Test Nebraska and get a test. From an infectious disease standpoint, I would always ask the question, what are you going to do with this information uh, when you are considering ordering a test? And if, if there's nothing that is going on to prompt uh, the test, such as symptoms or maybe an exposure, maybe there's someone else in the household. Um, I'm not sure how that information is going to affect what you do. However, I can say that if you do get a test that's positive, even if you're asymptomatic and um, maybe very low likely to be shedding virus, once you have a positive test, there will be a public health obligation to self-isolate for at least 10 days. So I would encourage people to think about that particular consequence when they are thinking about uh, testing. I want to move on and talk about some um, very important segments of the population, our children, our children and teens. We, of course, as a community, place a high priority on our children. And so um, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Sean Jones-Jokes, who is a board-certified pediatrician here in Lincoln. And um, as a pediatrician, what would you stress? Um, as the most important thing for your patients and their families to know right now? Um, you know, I think it's really important for parents to sort of put COVID-19 in perspective with their um, children. Um, the, this whole situation for most kids has been life-changing. They're going to remember this for the rest of their lives if they're at an age um, where they have that kind of long-term memory. And so um, I think it's really important for us to um, really emphasize with them that they're safe and that all the things that we're doing um, in the community to protect them are really to continue to keep them healthy and to make them safe um, and to try as much as possible to normalize things. Um, that includes our social distancing efforts. So um, when we're out in public, making sure that we're keeping that six foot distance, um, explaining and encouraging them that it's okay that people are wearing masks. It's not because they're bad guys. Um, and it's really because we all want to be able to be together, but we want to do it in the safest way possible. Um, and so I think that's one of the most important things to emphasize with our pediatric patients, especially the younger ones. Um, you know, I think if they have normalcy and they see confidence in their parents and the adults around them, that's when they also take on that confidence and they feel safe. Um, the other thing to know is that in most cases, um, infection with SARS-CoV-2 is mild in pediatric patients. Um, we don't see as many complications or as many ill patients um, with COVID-19 in the pediatric population as we do in the older population. And it's, I mean, there are clearly exceptions to that. Um, there are some patients with underlying diagnoses that put them at higher risk. Um, patients with moderate to severe asthma are at higher risk, but patients with mild and especially well-controlled asthma are really not considered at significant increased risk with this infection compared to the rest of the population. So, um, 
Uh, it's not necessary for us to fear more than we already do, or we actually um, is reasonable with this virus. Um, there have been some reports of some late complications of COVID-19, um, something um, parents may have heard of called MIS-C or multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. And that is a rare complication of COVID-19 infection. It's not something that we see commonly. Um, and it's something that typically children with that are very ill. It's the kind of thing that you're gonna know your child is sick. You're gonna know to contact your primary care provider um, and they will help to make sure that your child gets the care that they need. So, um, so I think for the most part, what I would want parents to know is to be reassured themselves that if we do the right thing and we socially dis uh, are socially distant, wear our masks and be positive about it with kids, we can help us all get through that in a positive way. That's really interesting because we had talked a lot about um, changes um, about the disease, about the symptoms, about the treatments, but I hadn't really given a lot of thought to how we role model this as adults to um, children in terms of um, uh, being a good uh, a good example to them, um, but also not becoming fearful. Um, and then uh, that's something that we can do as well, which I think is really, really important that you mentioned. Well, I know that your clinical practice has uh, undoubtedly changed. Yes. Are people who have been going or people who will be returning to see you for checkups and things like that, what might they be expecting or what might they see that looks different than perhaps pre-COVID? You know, I think it's a really good point. Um, I think we all have to remember that there are things that we have to continue doing and we can't put on hold forever. And one of those things is going to the doctor. Um, you need to have your wellness child checkups. You need to have your um, vaccines. Um, we saw, unfortunately, a pretty dramatic decline in vaccination rates um, over the first couple months of um, this pandemic. Um, and I hope that we will start to see that rebound and improve. Um, and I want everybody to know that your doctor's office is a safe place. Um, we, from the very beginning back in March, started to implement some procedures and have continued to do so, um, as have practices throughout the area, throughout the country, really. Um, in, in particular, separating sick and well patients so that they're not in contact with each other. Um, and so, for example, in our offices, we have well offices, and then we have one office where we see sick patients, and we screen all of the family members that will, uh, that will need to come in. So the guardian that's coming with them, the patient both before their appointment and at the time of their appointment, if they're having any symptoms, if they've had any significant exposures, if they've had right now any international travel, although early on it was lots of travel, but anything that um, tells us, you know, they really are supposed to be quarantining for right now. They don't need to come in for their well child checkup right then. It's not emergent. And so we can wait till that quarantine period is over and make sure that we're protecting not just our patients, but our staff too. Um, you know, we have some staff who are at high risk of complications of COVID and we want to make sure we keep them safe as well. And we all want to stay healthy so that we can keep taking care of our patients. So um, keeping the waiting room in your car, that's a whole new one. So, um, so when you call and check in, um, then the nurse calls you back and lets you know when we're ready for you to come back and you come in directly into the exam room. So for some offices, you might notice that's a back door or a side door. Um, it might be through the regular front door, but there's nobody there um, anymore. So big empty waiting rooms and people waiting in their car. So that's a new change. Um, and I expect that to, to stay the same, especially as we go into the fall and winter months where we're seeing more infectious diseases again, that's going to be even more important. And that's something that we do at both our sick and our well office. Um, doing sick exams um, and aerosolizing procedures like swabs outside. Um, that's something I, when I first started practicing medicine, I used to joke, I wish we could have outside clinic today when it was a nice day. And now I get to have outside clinic. And I'm not quite as happy about it as I thought I would be, but it is something that we're doing. So, you know, if I have a patient come in who I know we're going to need to do a nasopharyngeal swab for um, COVID testing, um, we'll do it outside in the overhang. Um, and so that decreases the risk of spread in the in the office um, setting. Um, and wearing masks, I mentioned before, making sure patients feel comfortable and kids feel comfortable around people with masks. You're gonna see providers with masks on, maybe with face shields on or goggles, and that's something new and different, um, but it's okay and it's safe. Um, and it's something that they need to be prepared for and kind of get used to. And hopefully as we're seeing more of that in the community, um, that's something that kids are getting used to too. 
Um, telehealth is something new. Um, telehealth, um, we started implementing telehealth in March, as most practices did. Um, and that's allowed us to keep some patients completely out of the office if we can manage their problem remotely. Um, and so, and for some things like, for example, um, uh, ADHD rechecks and some behavioral health things, that's been great. Um, sometimes it really just makes sure that we can limit the amount of time they're in the office. So if I can do most of the visit by telehealth and then just bring them in for the parts that they need to be in the office for, that limits their total exposure time too. Um, that's something that we hope we'll be able to continue when we're working with insurance companies to make sure that they keep up coverage of that so that we can continue to do that for patients. Um, and then completing some of your visit um, remotely, doing questionnaires and um, those kinds of things online so that that's completed before you come in for your appointment so that you're not having to fill out paperwork or answer questions um, uh, while you're here in the office. Um, that helps as well, too. So those are all some changes that you're, you'll see in the pediatric office and, um, and in the primary care office in general. Um, and all things meant to keep patients safe so that you can still come in and get that wellness care. You can still get your vaccine. Vaccinations. We can still make sure, sure that your child is developing and growing normally and make sure that they have all their needs met. Thank you so much for summarizing that. I know there's a lot of questions about um, the needs of children and the impact on children. And that's a great summary. I'd like to move on to talk to Dr. George Hansen, um, who's been a uh, board certified in family medicine for a long time in Lincoln, has a lot of leadership positions here and, and um, a lot of knowledge. And and perhaps you can add a little bit more to what you're seeing in your clinical practice as a family medicine doctor. Um, anything, the same things, different things, um, and what might you expect not only now, but in the future, if you're a patient of, of Dr. Hansen? Sure, Lori. First, I'd like to take just a second. One of my roles is as the current president of the Lancaster County Medical Society. I'd like to thank you and the Community Health Endowment and Dr. Nora and Dr. Jo jones Jobst as well for taking some time with us today. Um, you know, as a family physician, I would echo many of the things that Dr. Jones jokes mentioned, you know, and we take care of a lot of children from, from birth to, to their adolescence and, and adults as well. And I would add, we've, we've done a lot of the different screening procedures as well. We call our patients ahead of time. We, we also use the, the uh, parking lot waiting room. We have a small waiting room anyway, and we've kind of traditionally moved patients out of there pretty quickly. So for us, it wasn't too difficult of a, of, a, of a transition. I think it's been very, very hard for some offices, especially where they're inside of a larger building or up on two or three floors. So everybody, I think, you know, within the family medicine community, internal medicine community is just adjusting the best they can to, to maintain some distance, some location distance between patients. You know, this has been a big change for everybody. Uh, it's been a big change in our professional lives, a big change in our personal and, and lives, uh, you know, outside of outside of the, the office, um, our families, our churches, I think, you know, we are we're like everybody else, you know, we have families as well and um, activities outside of work. So one of the areas that I think in our office, at least me personally, that I've added back in is, is actually home visits, which, you know, there's still a, an exposure risk, but we mask up, uh, we glove up appropriately, we use hand sanitizers. So it's been an opportunity for some of my patients who are less mobile for me to be, to get out of the office, to be able to see them in the home setting. So it, it adds some, some value from that standpoint and also decreases their risk of exposure in this particular time frame. So I suspect that's something that we're going to keep doing going forward. Um, and it's been part of my practice for a long time, but it's a bigger part of it now. Uh, we also are doing a lot of telemedicine. We're doing a lot of uh, telephone medicine. Uh, we're doing, we have multiple different types of audiovisual platforms that are using Zoom like we're using today. Uh, Doximity, which is a kind of a doc related uh, audiovisual platform that's available to physicians and PAs, nurse practitioners. Um, also, a lot of people, I think, FaceTime. There's, there's still some concern, obviously, about uh, HIPAA compliance and patient privacy, and we've continued to do the best we can uh, with those issues. You know, for us as docs, I think, you know, we've been transitioning into the digital world now, most of us for the last, uh, I'd say, five to 10 years with electronic health records. For a guy like me, um, you know, who's been doing this for 32 years, that that was a hard enough transition. So adding some of this in has uh, has been more of a challenge, but but I think most of us are up to it. And, and uh, you know, from the standpoint of safety of our staff, our, ourselves, our patients, we're certainly willing to do whatever we need to, to to make that experience safe. But I would echo Dr. Jones' jokes that 
you know, one of the things that you don't want to get rid of in your life is your, is your exposure to your medical provider, you know, whether that's for wellness visits, for chronic care visits, uh, we're, we're concerned or we're, we're very concerned you know, that patients who have chronic disease processes are going to ignore those, um, you know, to their detriment potentially, uh, or they're sick and they're afraid to get sicker or become exposed to the COVID virus. So as a result of which they um, fail to show up with their heart attack or with their stroke or with their pneumonia. And uh, we're already seeing that. I mean, it's, it's been, I think, pretty fascinating in a sense that we've, as we saw COVID cases ramp up, we saw heart attacks in the emergency room declining, strokes declining, but we know that those things were actually probably happening. Um, so people maybe are not making it to the emergency room in one sense. So when this is all said and done, or at least over the next 12 to 24 months, I think there will be people looking at that data as well to help us understand, you know, what happened during this time. Um, because there's a, there's a lot of, wow, I'm not seeing that kind of stuff right now. And uh, I can tell you, and Dr. Nora can speak to this, within two weeks of us starting to practice social distancing, relative quarantining, isolation, we saw influenza disappear in our community. And it had been very active um, up to that point, probably 25% or so of the respiratory illnesses we were seeing in March were still influenza. And uh, it, it basically disappeared off the map. Um, so maybe maybe something to learn for the future when we have a bad influenza outbreak as well. One of the most controversial issues in recent months here has been about mask wearing. Yeah. Um, and you, you know that, and I'm sure you've had people who have approached you who um, feel differently um, about that. And so my, my, if you could just sum up um, briefly uh, what we should know about mask wearing in Lincoln. Sure. You know, I... I'd say probably three or four weeks ago, I wrote an op-ed for uh, the Lincoln Journal Star. And, you know, if you look at the comments section, I think right now it's about three-fourths genius, one-fourth idiot. Um, and, and I think really that to some extent uh, reflects the way our community is responding to the whole mask issue. And, and honestly, maybe as healthcare providers and, and the healthcare profession in general might have made an early mistake in this arena, and that we were encouraging people not to use masks, but I think we didn't do it for the, we didn't explain ourselves maybe as well as we should. There was some concern about shortage of uh, personal protective equipment as a result of which people were encouraged not to use masks. Um, you know, we've since learned a lot more about the transmission of this disease. Dr. Nora addressed that for us. We know uh, that a large number of people are without symptoms. And it's that number of people that we're very concerned about. You know, our expectation in this environment is if you're sick, you stay home. You quarantine yourself, you stay away from other people, you try to keep your family safe, your loved ones safe, you keep the rest of us safe. But the problem is with this virus, as Dr. Norris said, we may have as many as 25% of people or more who have no symptoms, know they're not, they don't know they're sick the entire length of this illness, as a result of which uh, they're potentially spreading it. And the masks, as we've talked about, the masks are most important to keep from spreading the disease if you are sick. So if, you, if you're wearing a mask, you're not sick, but somebody else is sick wearing a mask, your chance of getting this disease from them is probably less than 10%. And that's, that's, that's a, a number that I think we feel pretty comfortable with. If you're not wearing a mask and they're not wearing a mask, you have a significant chance of getting this disease. If the ill person is wearing a mask and you are not, you still are, are significantly protected, probably more so than if you're wearing a mask and the ill person is not. Again, both of us wearing masks. You know, we talk about social distancing and, and I think some people are offended by the whole idea of, of, you know, avoiding social events. I think for the most part, it's really kind of location distancing. You know, you're spreading yourself out a little bit instead of talking face to face or shoulder to shoulder, you're, you're trying to, to spend, you know, time together but maybe six feet apart, maybe eight feet apart. Still wearing a mask in a setting where you might have somebody approach you, I think is very important. Some people I think are under the impression that, hey, if we're six feet apart, we don't need to wear a mask. I would say that that's, that's a mistake in a social setting, especially when you're not living in the same home, of course, or you're in the same family living in the same home. In general, um, if you're indoors with a lot of people you don't live with, you should you should have a mask on. Well, we are running out of, of time, but we have just um, time enough for each of you to maybe 30 seconds tell me, um, you know, at a time when I think you can tell that perhaps people are growing a little bit impatient or a little bit weary of, of social isolation or of 
mask wearing or the restrictions they've been placed under or the differences they're having to experience when they go to see a, a doctor. I would just ask you all to give just really a final, final comment, a final statement about what you would tell people who are beginning to feel to feel a little bit weary about um, the pandemic experience. And Dr. Noor, I'll start with you. The uh, good news, I think, is that uh, there will be a time when this comes to an end. And I wish I could say it will be three months from now or six months from now or two years from now. But I have every confidence that there will be a time when we can just go back to the way uh, life was before. Um, until then, the best thing that we can do to minimize the risk that we have as much disruption to society is to practice these uh, social distancing measures. So um, I really applaud uh, everyone for doing their part. Uh, everyone has a part in preserving the public health at large. And uh, the more we all do, the fewer restrictions we'll have in the future and the sooner we will get over this. Dr. Joan Stropes, do you have any final comments about that? I just would really hope for everybody to have patience with each other. Um, I think as we all get tired of things, um, as we get tired of the changes, we, we want to go back to the way things were. Um, I think ultimately taking a deep breath and having patience with yourself, having patience with your children, having patience with your neighbor who maybe is not wearing their mask when they come over and ring your doorbell. Um, um, be kind to each other. Um, try to remember that um, this is hard on everybody, um, but we're all, all trying to protect each other. Um, that comment that um, I agree with Dr. Hansen completely, you know, we're wearing those masks to protect each other. I wear my mask to protect you. You wear your mask to protect me. Same thing with the social distancing um, and keeping that six foot distance. And so um, we have to remember to have patience with each other. We're not always going to do it perfectly, um, but we can all remind each other kindly um, to take care of each other um, and know, like, um, like Dr. Nora said, it's not going to last forever. Um, that will come to an end, but it's not going to be December. <laughs> so remember to have patience. You know, one of the things we know for mental health that exercise is incredibly important uh, during this time. So, you know, social isolation or isolation does not mean that you stay in your house all the time. Uh, get outside, enjoy the weather, exercise, get some movement, spend time with those family members who live with you, you know, outside of your home as well. Uh, but I can't emphasize any more what, uh, what Dr. Jones Job said too about just the, the importance of uh, the golden rule, okay? Just, you know, loving those people around us, being kind. You know, this is not the time to make people feel guilty about wearing masks, but at the same time, if there's an educational opportunity, and I think in the medical profession, we take that routinely, and people expect that. Uh, so we'll probably continue to do that. Well, that's awesome. I mean, you guys provided such a great scientific perspective, a great medical perspective, but a great human perspective, too, just about um, keep on keeping on being kind and, and getting outside and exploring the world around you. I mean, there are positive things that we can see in all of this, and I, I appreciate you sharing those. So I want to thank everyone for talking today, for coming on and sharing your experience, your wisdom, your advice for the Lincoln community as we continue to marshal on through um, these circumstances. If you have additional questions about the COVID-19 pandemic, about data, about things that you should be doing, I would encourage you to visit the Lincoln Lancaster County Health Department where they have a plethora of information and data available to you. And so on behalf of those folks at the Lancaster County Medical Society, the Community Health Endowment, and the Lincoln-Lancaster County Health Department, thank you all for joining us today.